Yes. Although I don't know if they're going to like what they find. You know, you never know. It's funny. <laughs> but, well, that's right. Yeah, he, he, he ducks out right just before he's turning back everything. It looks like there's several homeworks in here, so if you find one, you may want to keep looking and look for another. Yeah, I, I just I see there's a homework one here, and then I saw a homework two somewhere. I don't know if there's a homework three or my not. My homework one got lost, and I had to read it. Oh. Uh huh. Oh, okay. Um, I can take it and and put it back. I, I didn't grade it or not oh, or anything, okay. so. Um, let's see. What can yeah, I do? Works, is that an 80? I'm, ass I'm assuming so, I, I guess. Um, I can I can find out who the grader is and take your homework and, and put it in, in the box. Mm -hmm. If you want, if you want me yeah, to do that. Yeah, I have another 10 points. Okay. All right. So I'll. Right, no, yeah. What, why don't you do that? And then I'll just put it in their box. Okay. Um, I th this just showed up in my PO this morning, and I was told to to slap it down and let you guys finger through it. So, um, do you guys have the email that you? Yeah. Okay. Um, just send him an email, just saying, and just correspond with him directly, because I'm just the I'm just the delivery boy today. Okay. So. I, I can do that. Yeah, I'll just keep that with my stuff. Uh, we're, we're just grabbing homeworks, and if you have, like, one person, um, there was an addition problem in the number of points. So so if, if there's a problem with the, the, the amount of points that you got or something like, like that, just um, write a little note on the top, and I'll take it back to the TA. No. That must be Amitabh's. H-E? Swanson. Swanson. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not taking Nate. this class and teaching it at the same time. Nate. It's like the best way to do it, right? Oh, yeah, I suppose if you can if you can somehow swing that, that would be great. <laughs> sure, I, I know exactly all the answers to the yeah, homework. Well, like they had the... Hello, can you hear me? What's his name? Bo. Uh, the Chinese guy. Yeah. Master, he was the TA. He 
for 5.30 while he's taking his vitamin. He'd have to turn in all his homeworks like a week early. And then like... Oh, and Lance would grade it? Lance would grade it. Right. Tell him what he did wrong. I mean, he's really smart, so... Right. That's funny. So I think there's two... I'm assuming there's two TAs, Amitav, Trebane, I believe is his last name, and Naveen, and his last name starts with an R. Is it a conversion grade because it's over 70 to some way? Um, yeah, you can uh, just write a note, you know, just write a note saying whatever you want, like I'm not confused with this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take them and I'll put them back in their box. And then they'll they'll find that, and then yeah, it'll go from there. So, yeah, absolutely. Really? Um, two scores. Um, what I did is you. You add the points up. Okay. I don't know. That's um. I don't know what's going on here. I've ne I've never seen this before. <laughs> yeah. Um. If, if you want me to take it, I can just put it back in their box. Just write. Just maybe write a note up in the corner, just saying, you know, I'm, that's Naveen. I'm, sh I'm assuming these are their, their initials. Naveen and Amitabh. Hey Nate, can you hear me? Yeah, I, I think that's what happened. And hello. <laughs> so this is the same homework, and it's out of two different values. Well, it'll be slightly different, but not by much. Right. I don't get it. It's different. Are you trying to convert it? Strong convert? No, I think that you are. Yeah. Dry shift. That means that you don't want to be graded. Oh, can you guys hear me down there? They're the same. Yeah, they're the same problems. Yeah. Okay. So if you didn't hear this before, if there's an issue with your homeworks, homeworks plural. Um, Write a note on the top, give it back to me, I'll put it back in their box. I prefer this. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, if you, if you want to keep that, um, if you want to, if you, you know, whatever you want. No, I, I, this is not, this is not me at all. I, I'm just subbing in today for Chris. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the TA. Okay, I'm gonna Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Well... Let's get all this back. What's going on? All right. So let's get started then, huh? How are we all doing? Good, good, yeah. all right. So I'm, I'm subbing in for Chris today. My name's Nate Swanson. I'm a PhD student in the department. And he asked me to fill in for these next few hours because he's out of town. Um, Are you the one on the website, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Woo <-hoo. laughs> Yeah, that, that was a nice surprise. Um, so he tells me that you guys just went over PNNP, is that correct? Yeah, actually, just over Turing machines. Just over Turing machines. Yeah. He, he hasn't talked about P or NP or anything like that. No, no, no. We did that before. We did that before. And now you're talking about Turing machines. Yeah. Okay. Have you got, have you gone through uh, reductions yet? Yeah. Yes. 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 You've gone through reductions. He's gone through like circuit sat and yeah, yeah. all that exactly. fun stuff. All this three, yeah. Okay. So, so you guys know about reductions. Yes. Okay. You know about NP complete. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. 
All right, so what Chris asked me to do is to talk about some approximation algorithms for a couple of uh, MP-hard problems. And then he wanted me to discuss some of my research that I have been doing, which is working on an MP, what's that sound? <laughs> OK, whatever, and, and, uh, which is MP-complete. But um, I also thought, too, if, if there's any questions that you guys have had, because I realize probably a lot of you in this room are not theoreticians. You never want to be theoreticians. You're just taking this course. You either A, you know, fulfill the master's requirement, or B, pass the comps. So if this stuff is new to you, and when he went over it, you didn't understand it very well, um, sometimes it helps as far as learning something if you hear it from two different people. So I just wanted to give you guys an opportunity um, if, if any of that you know, reduction stuff didn't make any sense, um, I can go over it. Um, and if it's not fresh enough in my mind, uh, what I can do is I can just look over it between now and Tuesday and then have some material ready to go over it again on Tuesday. OK, so is there anything in particular that was really throwing you guys that you know, wasn't really clear? Like, how about uh, reductions? I mean, usually people have a little bit of Well, he briefly mentioned about MP hard. Could you tell us what it is? Okay, so let, let, okay, that's a good question. So, what's the difference between MP hard and MP complete? Okay. So, if I can just draw a little diagram here. So, here's P, and let me draw it like this. Here's MP complete, and here is NP hard. Okay. So basically, NP hard is everything above and beyond, NP complete being sort of the, the smallest shell of it. Okay? So NP hard means is that um, it's NP or harder, more or less. Okay? NP complete means is that it's, in, it's um, how do I say this the best? The hardest NP hard problem. Right, but it's still in the class NP. Exactly. Okay, it, it, it's kind of misnamed because I mean, up here you have like you know, exponential and you know, and then undecidable way up there. NP hard, that's through all of it, even though it's not in NP necessarily. Okay, NP complete means is that it's NP hard and it's still in NP, meaning that there's a polynomial way to verify the 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 whether or not a certificate is correct or not. So NP hard problems, they don't necessarily have a polynomial verification. <sighs> oh, I let let me let me look that up again. Um, all I know is is that um, the way I remember it is is NP hard is just everything above P. Okay. Okay. NP complete meaning that you know it, it's this thin little sliver right here. Okay, it's it's not the stuff above it. Okay, so if somebody says it's NP hard, that means that they've done a reduction. Okay, to uh, to a harder problem. Okay, it's not in NP. Okay, but um, I'll look that up and just to have a formal definition for you on Tuesday. Yeah. So many many problems like the flicks and so on, they are also NP hard, but they also are proven to be NP complete. So how do you explain? Okay, so so NP complete is a subset of NP hard. Right. Right. So how could it be and be complete? I understand it could be easier than NP hard, right? Because NP hard is not necessary <coughs> in NP. Right, but if you, I mean, so, sort of the, the the nomenclature of theoreticians, if if you say it's NP hard, a lot of the times they mean NP complete. They just don't want to, you know, say that those extra couple of syllables, like you know, um, like. 3 set, that's MP hard. Well, it's also MP complete. I mean, people interchangeably use the two. I mean, they, they technically mean MP hard is, is, a, is a slightly broader definition, but um, it's just, I don't know, I think it's just easier to say. I think that's why people do that. So. <laughs> it, it sounds harder than MP. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think it, it sounds cooler to say it's MP complete. You know, it's, it sounds fancier. I don't know why, but. I guess people get lazy as they get older. I don't know. So um, any other questions? <coughs> well, I actually have some problem with the 
Lambda calculus. Okay. Yeah. Lambda calculus. Yeah. Especially the time and exponential. Okay. Um. Lambda calculus. You get pulled away from integers to yeah, successors. So those kind of make sense, but. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's the church code. Yeah. The, the, say that again. The, the church code coding. Okay, I'm, I'll probably have to look that up. Yeah. Okay. Are you talking about the, the church washer, washer theorem? No, no, the church, he, the logician church, he, yeah, yeah. he imagined that he invented this lambda calculus. Right. So it's You're just talking about just how lambda calculus works and how it yeah, fits. That's, that's kind of his historic background for Turing machine, but. Right. I'm kind of confused. Right. So, so yeah, Church and Turing are kind of the you know the big names as far as foundate laying the foundations of you know theoretical well particularly complexity theory because mm -hmm. um but um tell you what let me do this if you have things that you want me to cover U N M dot E D U Send me an email from between between now and uh, next Tuesday, and maybe I can bring something up. Because uh, Chris gave me some material, and I think he wants me to cover it in the next three days, and I'm worried I'm going to cover it all today. <laughs> so, okay. So what I'm going to do then is I'm just going to talk about, well, I'll start with, kind of give some things about approximation algorithms, sort of the kind of the ins and outs of, you know, what people do with uh, approximation algorithms, what are sort of the pitfalls of approximation algorithms, yeah? And these are the same as, uh, or, the, or maybe sometimes they are the same as probabilistic algorithms, or? No, um, not they're not the same. So. Okay, so the difference between an approximation algorithm and a probabilistic algorithm is that an approximation algorithm will give some, well, I'll just write it like this. A lot of approximation algorithms will have some result like this. Okay, op star being the optimal solution to the problem. And this k here is some constant, okay? And if you have an approximation algorithm, what that means is that you have a way of getting within k times the optimal for your solution. Okay. So for an example, um, what I'm going to show you um, right now is vertex cover. And let me find the problem description here. Okay. Given a graph, you all know what this means? Vertices, yeah. edges, graph, okay. Um, you guys a few seconds here to write that down. Wow. OK, 
Okay, vertex cover. This is one of the um, kind of the canonical or standard computer science, theoretical computer science problems um, <coughs> taught all over the place in these types of classes uh, for teaching approximation algorithms. So basically what you got is a graph. You got some nodes and you got some edges. And your goal is to pick a subset of the, of the nodes such that every edge has one of its endpoints in your solution. Okay, so let me just um, at most one. Uh, at least one. Did I say at most one? I meant at least one. Okay, so let me draw an example here. So this is a graph. It's got some edges. It's got some nodes. And I'm just going to mark these right here. Okay. And I claim that this is a, is a vertex covering of this graph. Moreover, I claim this is the optimal vertex covering because it's minimizing the number or, or the cardinality of C. Okay, Because if you look, every edge in this um, graph has one of its nodes that is circled. That's part of the solution. Okay. All right. So this problem is NP complete. Okay. And what I'm going to show you is a a two approximation Opt star. to this, meaning that the algorithm that I'm going to show you will give no worse than two times the, op the, the, the minimal number of the optimal value. Okay? So in this case, one, two, three, four, five, the algorithm I'm going to show you will give you no worse than 10. Okay? All right, so can I erase this? Sure. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to order this out in, uh, in steps, and then we'll talk through it. So we'll start off with our answer set to be null. Okay, so what's going on here? We're starting off with our null set. Let me just 
to describe what's going on here. All right, so what we're doing is we're picking any edge in the graph. Let's say it's this one right here. And we're taking these two nodes and we're putting it in our solution. Okay. Now what we're going to do is this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, and this edge are not going to be considered for our, for any of our subsequent uh, pickings of edges. Yeah, yeah, with the bottom one. Bottom one should be included. The yeah, yeah, the one. This one? No. No. The one at the bottom. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh no, no, because it has to be it has to be adjacent to this edge right here. Okay. This this is our this is our candidate edge. So I'll mark this as number one. Okay. So this one was cut. This one was cut. This one was cut. This one was cut. Yeah. This one is still in. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <coughs> so let's see. Next, we'll, I don't know, we'll pick this one. Two. Here we go. Here we go. And we're cutting that one. Okay, next, let's choose this one. Here, here. Cutting this, this, this. And last, we have to choose this one. And there's no more edges. Edge set is empty, so we're done. Okay? Any questions so far? You choose edges randomly? Yep, choose edges actually not even randomly, arbitrarily. Okay. There's a difference. You can, you can you know, do them in, in some order, you can do them randomly, you can do them however you want, it doesn't matter. Okay. There may be a smarter um, ad hoc heuristic that you can sort of throw in there to maybe make some faster things once in a while, but for purposes of this algorithm, it doesn't matter. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we have eight, and the optimal solution before was five, so we are within two times the optimum. Okay, so. And that's an important thing to note. Just because it's a two optimal doesn't mean it's going to be exactly twice as bad. Okay, that's just twice as bad in the worst case. Okay. All right. So, all right. So let's think about this thing. Can anybody come up with a proof to prove that this thing will always generate a good solution? Meaning that the, the, the C that we return here actually is a vertex cover. How could you prove that? Give you guys a second to think about that. You could have a graph where right. there's no incident edges. So the worst case would be it includes everything. Sure. And then in this case, it will include everything. Mm -hmm. Right. OK. So, so that, that's sort of on the, on the right track. So what I'm looking for is, is just a well-defined argument that just clearly settles once and for all that this thing will always return a proper set, uh, vertex cover. Billions. OK. So basically, every edge is considered. And we did it on the edges. Not only if it's adjacent to. So the JSON one of the edges in this one vertex cover. So, mm -hmm. so they kind of. I can assume uh, one of the edges which say is not covered. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, I mean, the way you are traversing this is would contradict that. Right. Good. That that that's how you prove it. So we're gonna, we'll prove it by contradiction here. Assume that there is some edge that is not covered or some vertex. It's vertex cover, so we're covering vertices. Assume that there's a vertice that's not covered. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, wait a minute. Oh, edges. Okay, we're actually covering edges. Okay, sorry, I got confused. So, assume that there is an edge that is not covered. Okay. <coughs> well, 
what you can just say is either it has to fall into one or two groups. Number one, it was one of the edges picked, right? In which case, both of the vertices were marked, so it couldn't be that. Or number two, it was one of the edges that was deleted, which by definition has at least one of its edge endpoints in our solution, okay? The only other option would be that our algorithm isn't done yet, okay? So, so that's good. So that's, that's the proof that this will always return a valid uh, vertex cover. Okay, now here is the humdinger. How can we prove that this algorithm will always return no more than twice the optimal solution? How could we do that? Consider the worst case, and then if the worst case is like that. Yeah. Okay. Case, yeah, it's good to think in worst case. That's right. The worst case is that every edge are not coincident to any other ones. Mm -hmm. And so the minimum vertex color would be oh. half the number of vertices there. Because every time you're taking two vertices. Right. Yeah. So, but in this case, the worst case is we're picking all of it. Okay, say that one more time now. Okay. Uh, in your graph, all the edges are not incident to each other. Mm -hmm. All right, so the, the minimum vertex color would be in each of those edges, you take one vertex out. Mm -hmm. So the number of vertices you have in your solution will be oh, about half of mm -hmm. the total number of vertices. But this arrow term will pick all of it. Right, good, so, good. Okay, so I think this is what you're saying, but Basically, what's going on here is um, we pick all the edges, we right? Pick none, right? So l let's consider an example yeah, that's somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. Clearly, the optimal solution is going to pick one of these two. Okay. We're going to pick both, and that's going to be the case for every single edge. Mm -hmm. Right. So that it. So by that argument, we're going to go over no more than twice the optimal solution, okay? The worst case scenario is your part C will not going to be visited at all. Deletion will not be happened at all. Right, yeah, if, if we, I mean, it's always going to, unless it's a singleton, you're always going to delete at least one edge. At least, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay, good. Does everybody get this? Does that all make sense? Well, I mean, if you just consider each edge independently, like what you said, then you pick all the vertices. Okay. So what I'm doing is, as I'm, this is one of the edges that we're choosing. This is like one, two, three, or four. Right. Okay. And <clears throat> we're picking both of them. The optimal solution is always going to pick at least one of them. Okay. Now, um, it's an open problem, meaning that we don't know. Um, whether this analysis can be improved or not. Whether we can get better than a two approximation to vertex cover. This is the best known um, approximation algorithm to vertex cover that we know to date. Okay? Yeah? So did you prove it for a specific example of just a single line? Oh, no, no, no. Okay. Um, I wasn't very formal here. So what I'm saying is, is that this edge it can be any of the edges that we've chosen. Okay, you, you can apply it to, to anywhere. And what I'm saying is, is that the in our algorithm, we're, we're picking both. The optimal solution has to pick at least one of them. Right. So in the, in the worst case, we're going to be no more than twice of what the optimal chooses. But how do you know that your subset of of the edges considered for for the vertex is is part of the optimal solution. Like we do don't. You know? Okay. Okay. All we're concerned about is <coughs> this, the size. It, it's not how close we are to the optimal solution in terms of picking which ones. Okay. I still don't understand how your proof for one edge proves it for all graphs. Okay. So. So there's, the, okay, for any given edge that we choose, okay, either this is our algorithm, okay? Now, OPG star can either 
be this or this or both of them, right? OPG star is going to, for any given edge in our graph, right, OPG star is going to have one of these three behaviors in order to, to return a valid solution, right? Our algorithm is doing this. In the worst case, OPG star will do one of these two. Okay, and that applies to every single edge. So we are, we're, in the worst case, we're doing twice as much as what the optimal solution is. Okay. Um, hey, Nate. Yes. On uh, on vertex cover, if you have a standalone vertice uh, disconnected, no no edges attached to it, is it included in the cover or not? No. Um, in that case, then you have a trivial a trivial solution by just returning the empty set. Because all ev all edges are then covered. Okay. Okay. Does that Thanks. make sense? It, yeah. Yeah. I think it's the the name vertex cover is slightly confusing right. when you're actually covering edges right. I, or right. half edges or. Right. So I mean, I, I didn't make up the name, <laughs> but you know, I, I understand because I was I was actually I had to stop there for make, make and make sure that I was not reading things wrong um, for that very reason. Well, look at the bottom left edge. Our algorithm chose uh, to have one of them in the cover and one one of the vertices not in the cover. So, if for every edge we choose both of them, it seemed like we'd choose every vertex. So we we chose this edge in our algorithm. Okay. Okay. We're turning we're we're returning sets of vertices though. All right. So it's just every edge left in the bag or something. Right, so so we're returning vertices, not edges here. Right, right. We're we're using this edge picking method as a means to pick our vertices, okay, and by which we are covering all the edges because each uh, edge in this graph is adjacent to at least one of our nodes in our solution. Does that answer your question? No, but it seems like. As you said, the actual pick of the edges is not necessarily similar to the optimal solution. Right? No, it could be completely different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So why why can you do this kind of com comparison? They can be different edges. I mean. Right. But see, the thing is, is that you can, oh, however we we choose the edges, it's still going to be this case no matter how we choose them. Oh, so you're doing kind of one-to-one -one map. Not based on exact position, but. So uh, what I'm trying to do here is I, I, I'm trying to make a general statement for what's going on for every chosen edge. Okay. okay? It doesn't matter how we choose them. It's always going to be this this way. Because for every edge, the optimal solution is either going to pick one or the other or both. Right? That has to be the case for every single edge. Oh, yeah. So you and, mean and, and the optimal solution may probably pick some other edges that, that would oh, yeah. make it better, right? Right. I mean, for all we know, the optimal solution has this brilliant, you know, algorithm going on. You know, maybe has nothing to do with the edges. Maybe it does. Who knows? Who cares? Right. This is just the way that we're getting our solution. Okay. We're, right here, all we're doing is just comparing solutions. We're not comparing how we're getting to the solution. Right. So what do you mean? Right. So it's, it's kind of we, our algorithm part is kind of complete, but the optimal is just kind of a subset of it, right? Solution. Right. So what I'm doing here is I'm just enumerating all the possibilities that OpStar can have. Okay. I don't know which one, but it doesn't matter because regardless of whatever one it is, we still have our two approximation that will hold. Okay. And this brings up a good point because. This is probably one of the rare examples where we're actually able to deal with the optimal tour directly. Okay. Um, I think I'm, what I'm going to do now. Does, is, are there any more questions on Vert? Yeah. What was the case when you said it gives you a trivial solution of this set? Oh, that's when you just have no edges. <laughs> that's your graph. Right. Okay. Yeah, you always got to worry about those trivial cases, you know. Everybody, if you want to sound smart, always ask questions about the trivial cases, right? <laughs> no, 
I have one is a flavor. I used to always do that when I was in class. What's that? Go ahead. Trivial case, a flavor one, you just have one vertex. So when you have, right. When you have a flavor, then the vertex cover is one vertex. Right, yeah. So if you're smart, you know, like, and actually here, let me draw an example to show that. Can I erase this? Okay. So for those of you who don't know what this thing is, this is called a bipartite graph. kind of graph called a bipartite graph. Basically, you, you have two columns of nodes, and every node on this side is has an edge between it and every node on this side, but not any edges between itself and any of them on the same side. Okay, so it kind of has this, I don't know, familiar looking pattern, okay? You, you'll run into these more and more if you get into algorithms and graphs and stuff like that, okay? called the bipartite graph. Now, this, what we're going to show with this thing is that our two approximation is what is called tight. Meaning that you can come up with an example where you get exactly two times the optimal solution, okay? Which means that, um, from an analysis standpoint, you can't uh, lower that two approximation to say like a 1.5 or 1.25 or something like that. Okay. So what we do is, since um, our algorithm doesn't specify on how to choose the edges, we have to assume a worst case where we're picking all of these, the ones that run directly horizontal. Okay. So here's one, here's two, let's say, here's three, and all the way down, and here's n. Okay? So what's going to happen here is that, it's not a three. Okay, there we go. We're going to pick all the nodes in the graph, right? And then clearly the optimal solution is just to pick one column, yeah. right? Because if you pick one column, that covers the whole bipartite graph by construction. Okay, so by this example, we can say that this two approximation is as good as we're going to get as far from an analytical standpoint on our algorithm. Okay, does that make sense? Raise your hand if you don't know what that means. Do you mean that's the worst kind of worst case for this algorithm? Right. So here we're going to get exactly twice the optimal. Yeah. Right. <coughs> so that means that our two OPT star is tight, meaning it's not that our analysis is a little shoddy and we can actually drop this down to a little bit lower. We actually have an example to show that this is indeed the best that we're going to get from an analysis standpoint. Okay. Now, what I said before was is that we don't know if there's another algorithm that can do better. That we don't know. But the way that we, an the way that we analyzed this algorithm, that's as best as that we're, we're going to do. Okay, does everybody understand the difference between those two things? Okay. Okay. All right, so that's vertex cover. And so, so there's no possible graph that you could create where our algorithm would be, you know, 1.8 times the optimal. Oh, no, 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 no. That's, th there are actually a lot of... Yeah. I mean, there there may actually be. I mean, if, if if we get maybe even if we get lucky enough, our algorithm will generate the optimal solution. Okay, we certainly can do better than this. 
We're just not, we're never going to do any worse than this. Okay? And this example shows that we can do as worse as this. That's what tight means. Okay? So, okay. So, um, all right, so that's vertex cover. And if anybody doesn't have any more questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move. Nate, I'm gonna move yeah. Are there any other graphs that uh, you know, would uh, have two times the optimum? Is it just bipartite graphs, or are there other examples? Um, personally, I don't know. And it really doesn't matter from an analysis standpoint. As soon as you come up with one example for this, you're done. I mean, I mean, you you may want to like if you want to come up with a a, a ran, uh, like a, a randomized algorithm where instead of choosing them arbitrarily, you pick them randomly, and you may want to maybe do some sort of analysis on what's the probability of hitting some sort of worst case scenario. I mean, then you might want to be interested in you know sort of the ratio of that, but. For, for the terms of coming up with, of whether your analysis is tight or not, all you need is just one example. Certainly the trivial case also would satisfy that, right? Just one vertex. So in that case, both answers are zero. Right, well, that, well but then you have, you, you have the optimal solution. Okay. Yeah, and it's twice the... <laughs> it's also three times, though. Yeah. It's too trivial. Well, well okay, so... <laughs> Ignore that case. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> That's a trivial one. Yeah, um, I guess that. If you have one vertex, then the, the vertex both is zero. It's one is the solution. And it's not one, so it cannot be two. No, 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 no. It would, it would be zero in that case because there are no edges. You, you wouldn't want to include it. Well, let's forget that case. Right. <laughs> so, can you have a, another kind of graph where? Our algorithm ends up choosing all all of the vertexes, uh, but the optimal is less than half. No, so less than and, and the reason the answer is no, and the reason is because of this. Okay. Okay. We covered all the graphs just by that simple argument right there. Okay. Yeah. These questions are great because. You sort of have to build a little bit of an intuition. Sometimes this takes a little bit of time to sort of, you know, okay, if we have this, does this mean this? Or, you know, can we do this? Okay. Feel free to, if, you, if you're not clear on anything that we've done, you know, that's okay if you ask the same question again that somebody else asks. I'm more than happy to explain it again. Okay. Because once you get it, then you got it, right? And then you, then you know, and then you can sort of come to other problems and you don't have to go through all this mess again. Okay. Okay. So, what I thought I would do now is, um, what do we got? Half hour left. Yep. Three fifteen. Okay. Um, I'm gonna cover. I can either cover um, the three over two approximation to the traveling salesman problem, or I can go to my research and cover that problem. Okay. Anybody have any preferences? Your research. <laughs> My research, okay. Far more interesting than this stuff. <laughs> computer science side and there's kind of the radiology side. I'm, I'm just going to stick with the computer science side, okay? And I can talk about the radiology side if we have time at the end of the class. All right, so, so to the, uh, the, the problem that I worked with is called the lawn mowing problem. And I'll just stick to the, um, I'll just stick to two dimensions for the sake of simplicity. So
So the lawn mowing problem. We have some polygon. And we'll say, it's easier just to consider the square cutter. We'll say we have a square cutter, which is right here. And our goal is to take this square and move it along and cover every single point within this region. Okay. Okay. And our goal is to minimize the length of the tour. All right? So facts about this problem. It's NP complete. Um, the best previous result was a 3 plus epsilon approximation. And there's no brute force way to solve this problem. Meaning, if you want to go back to vertex cover, right? If you're really desperate to know the optimal solution for some problem for vertex cover, you can always take it to some supercomputer, you know, plug it in, have it run every single possible solution, right? You know, wait a couple months or whatever, and then you'll get the optimal solution. Okay? With this problem, you can't do that. Because since we're dealing with a continuous space, the solution space is uncountably infinite. Okay, so there's no way to just simply chug through all the possible solutions because it's infinitely large. Okay, so actually the result that we came up with is actually the best result that you can get, period. Not just the best polynomial time, but the best result, period. Okay, so that's kind of interesting um, about this problem. So um, can I erase this? So what was interesting about this result is not so much the algorithm, it was actually proving the lower bound on what we're going to do our analysis on. Okay? A lot of times if you get into theoretical research, finding your lower bound is sometimes just as hard, if not harder, than actually um, figuring out the algorithm that you're going to use. Okay? Because before, in vertex cover, we were kind of lucky because we were sort of able to use the optimal solution so semi-directly, okay? But for the vast majority of results out there, there's no way to say, okay, this is twice of the optimal because, well, we can't say that because we don't know what the optimal solution is. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, go ahead. Did you have a question? Uh so what do I mean by the optimal solution here? Like, mm -hmm. uh, so the optimal solution is this. So if you want to, let me just draw a little point here. So this, let's just say it's this. I mean, the zigzag is often kind of a, it's a tour, so we're going to come back there. Okay, so this point here is the center point of the square. Okay, and what we're doing is we're moving this square along this path. Okay, and in order for it to be an optimal solution, it has to cover the entire polygon, and the best solution is going to be the one that minimizes the length of the tour. Okay. Okay. So you cannot rotate with that, right? No, the the the, 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 the coordinates of, yeah the, of the square is fixed. But no, it does not cover all polygons. <laughs> oh right. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean it has to go out. This, this is just an example. Yeah. But the, it, it can cover something outside polygon. Oh yes, that's a good point. Um, one very important point, actually, you, you're allowed to go outside of the polygon. There's a different problem that restricts you to staying within the polygon, and that's called the milling problem. Okay. All right. So what we're going to do is um, I'm going to briefly show what the lower bound is, and then. I'm guessing we're going to run out of time. 
OK, so for the previous um, and let me just draw another polygon here. For the, for the 3 plus epsilon, epsilon approximation, what they did was is they showed that if you take a grid, this is a very terrible looking grid, but I hope you guys will get. OK. We're only going to consider uh, movement along this grid. So what, what they did was is they took all the grid nodes that they had to cover that one, let's say, and then just um, find the, the, the best solution that they can that visits all these points. If we visit all these points using the square cutter, we're also going to cover the polygon. Okay, And this gives you a three approximation. The size of the square is like it's one of the parameters. Right. It's it's predefined by the problem input. Yeah. So in this case, the the square, if you if you lay them side by side, they're going to perfectly tile, you know, the the entire graph. Okay. Yeah. So when I don't know the optimal solution, what does it mean to say thrice plus epsilon the optimal? Yeah. Okay. Right. So that that, that that's what I was trying to explain before. We don't know what the optimal solution is. It's a very nebulous term that we have no way to quantify, or you know. And the, and the whole goal for for this and for this problem especially was trying to find some way to to do that. Okay. Now, what the general strategy is is that you take something that you know is always going to be less than the optimal solution, but you can get a grab on and you use that as your starting point for doing your analysis. Okay? So in other words, what they did here is, um, well, I'm not going to go into that. That's going to take too long. Okay, so that's the three approximation. What we did was is that we said, well, let's slide this grid around a little bit, and let's find the, gr the best uh, configuration of the grid with respect to the polygon, and then let's do the same trick. Okay, does that make sense? So, is every point in the grid uh, also in the polygon? No. So, so the grid is infinitely large. Okay. All we're interested in is the grid nodes that are around the area of the polygon. Okay. And what we're doing is we're we're saying, okay, let's we can we can uh, shift around this grid a little bit. We can we can wiggle things around a little bit. And maybe we can reduce the number of nodes that we need to visit. Okay. Now, what we did was is, oh, how am I going to describe this? Right. So, right, and, and that's important to note because if if you say we're just going to throw a grid on there with respect to the polygon, in terms of your analysis, you always have to then assume the worst possible configuration to do your analysis. So, if you can avoid it, you know, you always want to sort of be smart in how you do things like that. Okay. Oh, here, let, let me do this first. The reason why this is a three approximation is because of this. Let's say we have this situation. Okay? And our polygon runs just outside. Okay? Because the square that we have here is unit length. Okay? And if we have this distance here be one half plus some small constant. And this side here being one half plus some small constant, um, that means you're going to have to visit all these three rows, right? But the optimal solution would be just to sort of do this slight little zigzag through this little corridor, okay? And you, and you get roughly a, a factor of three blow up, 
plus or minus some very arbitrarily small constant. Okay, does that make sense? Don't you miss some part? Like, don't you miss the right side if you take only the left side? Yeah. Right, so, so, okay, so imagine though that um, you have a square. So if we're on this point right here, the square is right here. We'll say it's like that. Okay, if you slide it down, this point, that's going to cover all this, and then when you hit this point, it's going to cover this point here. Oh, I see. See? It's a little different. It, it takes a little bit of time to sort of get used to that, but... Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so, so just a simple little zigzag pattern will, will get you through it. Okay? Now, what I'm going to try to explain in the next 15 minutes is how, by shifting the grid, we can come up with a lower bound on um, on something that we can use to prove a result from, okay? Because we're not going to be able to uh, prove anything from the optimal solution directly because we have no idea where it is, okay? So let's let's draw a grid. Okay, now how does this go again? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to have, we're going to change the optimal solution into I N can't spell <laughs> Okay. And actually I don't think I'm gonna be able to finish this all today, but I, I can just do this first part just to sort of give you a flavor of what's going on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the optimal tour and I'm going to transform it into, and I'm going to count the number of intersections that the optimal tour has with the, the edges of the grid. Okay? So in other words, I'm going to say that OPT star is greater than or equal to, um, let's just write, number of intersections. Okay. Green edges, it's like all, all edges are all only like square on the side. It's all lines. Right. Okay. So let's just assume that this line right here is the optimal solution. Okay, we're going to have one, two, three intersections, and let me just go out a little farther just to give him more of an example. Four, five. Okay, and what I'm claiming is that the number of intersections of the optimal tour in the optimal um, grid configuration is a lower bound on the length of this tour. Okay. And what we're going to do probably next lecture is I'll show you how this thing we can use to prove a result. Okay? Does everybody understand sort of the, the big picture of what's going on here? What I'm doing is that I'm taking this nebulous term, the optimal tour, and I'm finding something that we know is going to be no greater than it, and we're going to use that thing to sort of springboard off of and prove our result from. Okay? This is the general strategy. If you, if you can't work with the optimal strategy directly, you find something else to work with that's always going to be smaller than that. What are the intersections again? Okay. So we're slapping a grid mm -hmm. uh, on the polygon and the, um, on the optimal tour. Okay. Now the optimal tour is going to be crossing the lines of the grid some number of times. 
And I'm saying the number of these intersections is going to be a lower bound on the, um, on the optimal tour. Okay? On the length of it? On the length of it, yes. All right, so let's just draw one little segment here. I, I don't think I'm going to do this formally, but I'll, I'm just going to try and sketch it out just to give you guys sort of an, a sketch of, of how this works. Okay. Let's start off with this intersection right here. At this infinitesimal point along the optimal tour, okay? We're assuming that this is the optimal tour. Right now, with this grid configuration, it intersects it right at that point right there. Okay? Now, let's consider shifting the grid over by an infinitesimally small amount. Okay? So, here's one. Now, we're going to two. And we've shifted things over. And now, we have the old one, and now there's a new one. Okay, right next to it, right, okay, and we're going to keep moving that along, okay, along the in unit interval, okay, the open unit interval. Well, why does it have two intersections now? Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm accumulating the number of intersections, okay, so this first one here was from up here, because it intersected it up here. Now, on the, in the second example, I've slided the grid, grid over a little bit. And now this, this notch here that's right next to it is our next one, okay? And what you're going to do is as you keep shifting it over, you're going to notch up the entire unit interval, right? Mm -hmm. Now the thing to note here is that because the grid is periodic, by shifting it over by one full unit interval, you're going to cover the you're going to cover everything, right? Because this length is going to be covered from this one right over here. Okay? Okay. All right. So what we got here then is a bunch of intervals for, um, on the optimal tour. Now the question is is that if you um, what do you get if you integrate? Let's call each of these intervals. These little notches, let's call them dx. Okay? What happens if you integrate dx over the unit interval? What do you get? One. One. Okay? Basically, what we're doing is we're adding up all these infinitesimal little notches. Okay? There's an infinitely many of them. They're infinitesimally small. You do the calculus. You get back the length of the tour. Okay, so now what happens if we minimize the number of intersections over all of the unit intervals in both the horizontal and vertical axis? It will be like medium range. Okay, so let me draw an example here. Let's. Um, so, do you mean that the only legal pass would be? Horizontal and, and right. So else. so okay. I, I forgot to mention that we're going to assume that the optimal tour is rectilinear. That's okay. going to be part of the input for a square cutter. I forgot to mention that. Okay. Um, it gets more a little more, actually not too much more complicated when you have arbitrary direction, but um, all this we're not going to worry about that. So we have an optimal tour. Okay. And then let's let me show you a yeah let's do this and then we have a suboptimal tour which is like this that's maybe just encapsulates okay same tour. We've just shifted the grid around. Okay, there's less intersection here than we have right here. Okay. Now, what I want to show to you that 
is that if we can minimize the number of intersections um, that the grid has with the optimal tour, that is a lower bound on the length of the optimal tour. Okay? So far, so good? Yes? Um, just heuristically, if you just divide the area of the polygon divided by your unit square, mm -hmm. shouldn't that be some kind of a lower bound on your length? Okay, say that again? You take the area of your polygon. Uh, uh, of yeah, okay. whatever, yeah, and divide it by your size of your square. Divide it by the size? So Divided so you're saying break it up in, into chunks? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the number of chunks you have. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, you're saying you want to take the total area. Okay. Now, that's a great idea, except let's say you have a polygon that's extremely skinny. Okay. okay. It's very, 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 very skinny. Okay. In that case, the, uh, that's a counterexample to show that that won't work. I see. So uh, in, in some sense, your size of your mower is also fixed. I, I would reduce the size of the grid in that case. And, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, the size of the, of the mower with respect to the polygon, I mean, something has to be fixed. Because otherwise, what you could do then is just shrink your mower to infinitesimally small and, and generate it. Yeah. So great idea, but it, it unfortunately doesn't work. Okay, so, all right, what's the next step here? So we have our integral, and then we'll do the same thing for the y-axis as well. Okay, so we have the entire optimal tour length covered. Now what I want to show is that if we shift, if we have the, the uh, grid setting that minimizes the number of intersections, then we have a lower bound on the optimal tour. Now we had uh, we showed ooh, well, I'm almost out of time here. We showed two ways in which um, we can prove this, and I'm going to show you the randomized result just because it's probably quicker and, and a little bit more interesting. So. If we choose any, um, if we randomly pick a grid setting and just slap it down, what is the expected number of, um, let me write it down, what is the expected number of intersections of a grid with respect to the optimal tour if it's randomly placed. Okay? So we have an interval on the y-axis and an interval on the x-axis. We choose a random number between those two intervals. That's our orientation in which we lay out the grid. Okay? So does anybody, um, are you guys familiar with um, how integrals work? So let, let's draw this out here. Marker's dying. Okay, so here's zero, here's one. This is, let's say this is for the x-axis. And we're gonna plot the number of intersections over the y-axis for a given fixed y. Or, excuse me. We're gonna fix y, we're gonna shift it along the x-axis, and we're gonna plot the number of intersections. Number of intersections. Okay, and it's gonna look something like this. Okay, it's going to be some function, right? We know that the integral of this function is 1. Square bit, uh, uh, under this line. What's that? It's square under this line. 
Okay, it actually will probably look maybe something more like this. It maybe have some sort of sharp fall. I don't know. So in other words, in this little section right here, this is kind of bad because the number of intersections has increased, right? Here, it's pretty good because it's decreased and so on and so forth, right? The total integral is 1, okay? Right? We know that because of this before. Now, if we throw down and just choose a random point in the middle, what's going to be our expected value? This is a definition of calculus. Okay? Another way of saying the integral, another way of looking at the integral is that it's going to be the weighted average over the continuous domain. Mm -hmm. Okay? Do you guys remember that? Yeah. Okay. So, and that's just for a random picking. Okay? And what's and the weighted average is exactly the optimal tour. Okay? If we do it, if we add them all up for the whole kit and caboodle. Okay? Am I losing you guys? Yes? No? Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly wrap this up here. Okay. So basically, if you pick one at random, the expectation that you're going to get is the, of the number of intersections is going to be equal to the length of the, of the optimal tour. So if you choose, if you are real careful about how you pick it, you're going to go less than whatever a random pick you're going to get. Okay? So let me say that again. So if you randomly choose a configuration with respect to the polygon, what you're going to expect to get is the number of intersections equaling the optimum length. Okay? Now the thing about an average is that if you're going to have an average, that means that you're going to always have at least one of those values, like if you, you know, 2 and 3 and 4. Okay? The average of this is 3. Okay? If you have the average, you're always going to have at least one value that's going to be less than or equal to the average value. So if you pick the uh, the grid placement that minimizes the number of intersections that's going to have to be less than or equal to the average, okay? So to so sort of sum up all this, if you can move the grid around with respect to the polygon and choose the grid setting that minimizes the number of intersections of the optimal tour, then you have a lower bound on the value of the optimal tour. Okay, it's time to go. I'm sorry if I lost you all. Um, <laughs> this makes perfect sense to me because I've been looking at it for two years. It's fine. Yeah. We have something to talk about that. Right, right. Um, I, I'm, I may talk a little bit more about this, and then I want to move over to uh, traveling salesman tour, the three over two boxes. So if you're fine with that, we can keep this. I think so. Hold on to it. I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, then, then you should be fine. That should be recorded. Yeah, if, if you want me to take your homeworks, and if you have any comments, then I'll turn it again. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yes. Is there a polynomial solution? Um, no, uh, at least we don't know of any. <laughs>